Romans chapter 1, please. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get started into the service today. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for all you do for us. Father, thank you so much for uh, allowing us to have so much and be so, so privileged. And Father, we pray that we would never take that for granted. Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word again. And I pray that we would glean something from it today that would change our lives and help us draw closer to you. We love you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want you to think about something. So I know it's like 6 o'clock in the evening and you're winding down and you don't really want to think too much, okay? But I want you to think with me, all right? Have you ever actually sat down and taken stock as to what we have in Jesus Christ? Have you ever sat down and taken stock and thought about what we actually have in Jesus Christ? I mean, sat down, wrote it down. This is what I have in Jesus Christ. Many times we'll sit down and we'll write down like what we have in our house, right? In case we have a fire or something like that, like we'll write all this stuff down and these are all the contents. So, so my fire insurance and my house insurance is all taken care of, right? We sit down, write all that out. Or stores do inventory, figuring out what they have left. Have we ever taken stock, have we done inventory on what we have in Jesus Christ? So often, and when I say so often, I mean really really often we take for granted what we have in Christ. We take for granted what we have in Jesus Christ. We forget the extremely incredible benefits that we have been given by Christ. And Paul continues in his introduction and he refers us back to that gospel. And he begins to give us a little bit. And when I mean a little bit, I mean just a little snippet of what Christ can do in our lives. So let's read Romans chapter 1. Look with me in verse 1. The Bible says this, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Remember that, that's going to come in handy again here today. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, verse 6, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Specifically, this evening, I want to focus in on verse 5. We finished up verse 4 last week, but today I want to focus on verse 5. Let's read that again. By whom? Who is that? We'll talk about that in a second. We have received, what have we received? Grace and apostleship. For what purpose? For obedience to the faith among all nations. Why? For his name. As we begin, I really want to focus in on that word received. Received. By whom we have received. Received is the act of accepting. Okay, this is not rocket science, all right? Follow me. I know I asked you to think, but follow me here, all right? Stay with me. Receiving is the act of accepting. I am accepting something. There's a receiving and a shipping department, right? There's a shipping and receiving. Why? Because you're shipping out and you're receiving in. Okay? That's the type of receiving we're thinking of. However, receiving gives the impression that we did not do anything to get it. Think about that. Receiving gives the impression that we did not do anything to get it. We were simply the recipient. Key, important, okay? This is so important. So that's what receive leads us to believe. But the question is then, from whom did we receive? If we're to receive something, it's got to come from somewhere, If we're going to accept something, it has to come from somewhere. So from whom did we receive? Look at verse 5. He says, by whom? Well, that, that doesn't give us the answer, does it? So in order to find out whom, whom is, we have to go back. Now, the entire thing so far, other than the first verse, is talking about Jesus Christ. 
concerning his son Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom? So here's the reality. Jesus Christ and how we proved that he was the son of God last week. How we proved by all of these different things, by Christ our Lord, made of the seed of David, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of dead. By that, by that Jesus Christ, by the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is what we have received, is how we have received, by whom we have received. So we received it from Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Jesus did all of the giving. And we get all of the getting. I know that's pro- improper English. But it works, all right? Jesus did all of the, the giving. We get all of the getting. Or we get all the receiving. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Did you see? Gave and have. Jesus gave so that we could have. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God gave something for us. God was the giver, we are the receiver. You can't, I can't say that enough. God was the giver, we are the receiver. God was the giver, we are the receiver. We did nothing to get it. Nothing. We didn't pay for it. We didn't work for it. We did nothing to receive. God gave. We get the benefit from Jesus. We did nothing to obtain it. He handed it to us, and we simply received it. Or at least I hope you received it. John chapter 1 and verse 12, listen to this. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. As many as received him, what? To them gave he power. Listen, God is the giver, always. Listen, God is the giver. We are the receiver. We are on the receiving end. Receiving is one of the most amazing opportunities that we have in Jesus Christ. And so often, and when I say so often, I mean really, really often, we forget about what we have received in Jesus Christ. What we did not work for in Jesus Christ, but what we have received. And here we have the opportunity to receive from Jesus. Well, what do we receive, Pastor Yeomans? Well, again, notice here in the verse, by whom we have received grace. I could preach, I'm pretty sure, a thousand messages on that one word, grace. I won't, okay? Not tonight anyway. But grace, we've received grace. And so we need to turn over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 Limber up your fingers again because we're going to turn a lot. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Look at verse 16. John chapter 1 and verse 16. John 1 and verse 16. The Bible says, And of his fullness. Have all we, what, received. And grace for grace. Watch, verse 17. For the law was given by Moses. We know that. But watch. But grace and truth came by who? Jesus Christ. Okay, so we have received by whom, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, we have received grace. By the way, grace does not come from anyone but Jesus Christ. Truth does not come from anyone but Jesus Christ. We have received this from Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, most of you would know this. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's nothing you could do, not of works. 
lest any man should boast. Listen, if it's of works, then it is no more of grace. If you can earn it, we talked about this in 1 Corinthians, if you can earn it, it is not of grace. Grace is given. Grace is unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You can't work for it. You can't gain it. You cannot pay for it. You can do nothing to get grace. It has to be given. Listen, write this down. Grace is always given. Grace is always given. Grace is always given from Jesus Christ. We have received the incredible grace of God through Jesus Christ. He gave us something that we did not deserve. What was that? He died on the cross. Why? So that we did not have to die and spend eternity in hell. That's gracious. That's merciful. He made a way for us to have a relationship with Him. You see, I find this so amazing. Because in the beginning when God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1, He created man on the sixth day. And they had a wonderful walking, talking, fellowship with each other. They had a wonderful relationship, a face-to-face relationship, walking, talking with God. Beautiful relationship. And then stinking Adam and stinking Eve messed it up. Sin. And what happened was then sin separated us from God. No longer could we have that walking, talking relationship with Him anymore. And God kicked them out of the garden and said, you now have to do all of this work and you're going to sweat and you're going to have child labor and you're going to have to submit to your husband and all of those curses. And what God tries to do, He says, I want to get them back. I want to make a way where we can have them back together in fellowship with me, where I can walk and talk with them again. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is our atonement. Folks, that's grace. God did not have to do that. God could have just done what he probably should have done. And just sent us all to hell. Sent us all to death. And then send us all to the lake of fire, which is the second death. Just just dying. But no, he said, I want to give you life. Grace. Amazing grace. And so we now have access to God. Again, in fact, the Bible tells us in the in the gospels that the veil of the temple that split the holy holy of holies with the holy place, the veil of the temple was rent in two. We now have access to God. We can come boldly before His throne. We have access to God. We can walk and talk with Him. We have received grace from Him. Now remember, in order for Jesus to provide us with this grace, I want you to remember, He is a spirit. John chapter 4 and verse 24, they uh, that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth because God is a spirit. So God is a spirit. We talked a little bit about this last week. And he had to put on mortal flesh. Philippians chapter 2. He was tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And he died in our place. Amazing. But hold on. We need to go back to John chapter 1. We've spent a little bit of time here already in John chapter 1. But this is the theme of John chapter 1. It is Jesus. John chapter 1, look with me in verse 12. We've already read this. Watch this. But as many as received him, to them gave he power. For what? To become the sons of God. Now let me ask you, is that spiritual or fleshly? Say it out loud. Spiritual. To become a son of God, you've got to be spiritual. Okay, notice, even to them that believe on his name, and it it describes it in verse 13, which were born, how? Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, how? But of God. Okay, now this, I I, I don't even think I can explain this properly, but this is mind blowing. I love this. In order for us to gain spiritual life, Jesus had to put on 
flesh. God is a spirit. And he put on mortal flesh in order to give us spiritual life. Listen, he became like us in order to give us access to become like him. That's not even close to explaining it well enough. That's the best I got. That is so mind-blowing to me. That is grace, guys. That is unmerited favor. Almighty God coming down in human form, taking upon the form of a servant. Put on flesh. Why? So that we could have what's now known as the second birth. The spiritual birth. John chapter 3 that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Listen to me. We could never have a spiritual birth outside of Jesus Christ. Never. And so our spiritual life did not come from us willing it into place. Verse 13. It was not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Listen. We could not do anything. To, to come close to the glory of God. As Romans chapter 3 tells us, for all have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. All our righteousnesses, as Isaiah tells us, that are, they are is filthy rags. The best thing you can do, you will fall short every time. And so God, in his gracious mercy, Bridges the gap with the cross. With Jesus Christ. Cleanses us of our blood. Our spiritual life did not come from fleshly desires. Listen, you can do nothing to gain it. It came from God. God gave it and now we have the opportunity to receive it. Man, again, this may be not news to you, but this is exciting to me. Nothing in our lives could we do to gain the grace of God, yet he gave it, and now we get the opportunity to receive it. What else did we receive? We received grace. Go back to Romans 1. What else did we receive? Romans chapter 1, verse 5, by whom we have received grace... And apostleship. Apostleship, okay? We believe that we are not apostles. Let me make that very clear. However, we've received God's calling. Paul was called to be an apostle. So what have we received? We received grace, and we've received, if I can apply it this way, we've received God's calling on our lives. Listen, again, I've said this before, and I've said this in, in Romans. God did not save us. God did not give us grace for us to sit here and do nothing with it. He did not call, or he did not save us for us to sit on padded pews a couple times a week. It's not what he called us for. He called us to do something. In fact, God gave us grace. God gave us a calling Paul the Apostle was called of God specifically to reach the Gentiles. He had a specific calling on his life. In fact, we call him the Apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, the Apostle to the Jews. Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles. He was, that was his calling. He said, listen, enough with the Jews. I go to the Gentiles. That was his calling in life. I want you to understand this evening. We have all, listen, we have all Hear me, we have all been called to something. Again, I wish I could stand up here and tell you that's, this is what you need to do to everyone. I can't do that. But God in your life can do that. Again, we have the opportunity to receive that calling. If you think about it this way, he has delegated his authority to us to spread the gospel. He has relegated his authority to us. 
He says, listen, I have something for you. Here's my authority. Go and preach the gospel. Now, we get to receive that. In fact, let's just, okay, go, let's just go to Matthew chapter 28. I can tell you don't believe me. Matthew chapter 28. By the way, I don't want you to believe me. Believe the word of God. If, if the word of God, if I say it and the word of God does not back it up, throw what I say out. Go with the word of God every single time. But look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, 18, excuse me, through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, watch this, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Because of that power, guess what? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And watch this, watch this. And lo, I am with you always. So I've delegated my authority to you, and I will be with you during the whole thing. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. God has all power. God has all authority. And he has given us his power. He has given us his authority. And he will be with us until the end of the world, until his will is accomplished. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. Actually, yeah, let's go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. Before I transition to this, I want you to think about Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. So God has given us his power. He has given us a calling. He says, go and do it. I will be with you always. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. He says this, and he... Being God, Jesus said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul then says, Most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul in Romans chapter 1 is just introducing himself. He says, listen, we have received grace, but not only grace for salvation, but grace to accomplish that which God has called us to do. Notice, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. So not only does God work grace in salvation, God's grace works in his calling on your life as well. God has so much grace. It's overflowing. It's unmerited favor. Does God need to use us? Does God need to use us? Absolutely not. It's gracious. What a privilege it is for God to use us. Oh man, I got to do this for God. No, 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 no. Again, I get to do this for God. Way different perspective. I get to be the one. I get to be the one that preaches to Bible Baptist Church. Not I have to be the one. I get to. It's an opportunity. It's a wonderful privilege. Listen, we have received grace and a calling. I want you to go to Romans chapter 1 again. I told you to turn in a bunch today. Romans chapter 1, look at verse 6. I believe he's talking about all nations here. Verse 6, he says, Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Again, this is a calling. God has called you. He did not save you to sit. He saved you to serve. He did not, let me say that again. He did not save you to sit. He saved you to serve. 
And God has called us to something. So God has given us something special. The question is this, have we received it? Have we received it? Paul had. He says, listen, by whom we have received. It's already received. I've already taken it. I've received grace and I've received apostleship. Let me ask you tonight, have you received the grace that was given to you for salvation? I look across this room tonight and everybody I think knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But maybe you're sitting here listening to this and you do not know the grace of salvation. It's freely offered. All you have to do is receive. Let me ask you this question. Have you received the calling that God has called you to? Just like you have to receive salvation, you have to receive the calling that God has called you to. Many people reject salvation. There might be people here tonight that are rejecting his calling. Saying, no, I'm not doing that. Let me ask this question then. What is the purpose of this grace and this calling? What is the purpose of this grace and this calling? By the way, by the way, you cannot receive the calling without grace. You cannot receive the calling without grace. Once you receive the grace, then you can perform the calling. Again, for what purpose? Notice with me in verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship, what? For the obedience to the faith among all nations. For the obedience to to the faith among all nations. Do you ever wonder why the Bible and Paul in particular uses such weird terminology? Like, why don't you just tell me what it looks like in English? Right? Like, this just doesn't make sense. Why is he using the terminology obedience to the faith? Obedience. I'll I'll be honest. I don't like the sound of that word. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Man, I think my parents just made me sing that just so I would obey them. Right? Why would Paul use the word obedience? To be honest with you, I don't like the sound of this word because it makes me think that there's only one way. It's either I obey or I am punished. Right? That's the way it was in my house. I don't know about your house. That's the way it was in my house. I I obey or I'm punished. I don't like that. That's too restrictive. It's almost as if God is saying it's my way or the highway. Obedience to the faith. Well, it just so happens that John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Sounds pretty restrictive, doesn't it? Sounds pretty uh, much like my way or the highway. I mean, no, God doesn't have that attitude. But it's obedience. So in order to come to the Father, you must go through the faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We, we read this, or talked about this before. For by grace are ye saved through what? Faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So you're saved through, by grace, through faith. By grace, through faith. There's, so you're saying there's no other way. There's not multiple ways to get to Jesus. No, no. There's one way. By grace, through faith. By grace, through faith. We are by grace, through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This means that if we are not obedient to by grace, through faith, then guess what we are? What's the opposite of obedient? It's disobedient. And it's funny. Paul already confirms this thought process in his letter to the Ephesians. Go to over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 
Look at verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says this. And you hath he, being Jesus, quickened or made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Listen, this is the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Transforming you from death unto life. Verse 2, watch. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of what? Disobedience. So when you walk according to the course of this world, you're in disobedience. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the minds, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, but God, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he hath loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace. Ye are saved, washed us, and hath raised us up together. And made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Again, verse 8 and 9. Man. The reality is this. There is an obedience. And there is a disobedience. There is a proper way, there is the way, or there is no way. Listen, I don't make up the rules. I'm just telling you what they are. And this is why Paul, listen, Paul does not use words flimsily. Every word packs a punch. Why would he say obedience to the faith? Because listen, there is only one way. It is only through Jesus Christ that there is grace. It is only through Jesus Christ that there is truth. There's no other way. The opposite of obedience is disobedience. And again, that may sound harsh to you, but these are the rules of the game. This is what God has put in place. In fact, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other way. It is only through Jesus Christ. Go back to Romans chapter 1, please. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 5. For the obedience to the faith among all nations. Among all nations. Now, there is a Jewish contingency in the church at Rome. I want you to remember what the Jewish typical mindset was. We are God's people. We are something special. We were chosen by God. And the, everybody else has to convert. We have to proselytize everybody to Judaism. Paul's making a point here. Among all nations, among all ethnicities, every person, everywhere. Listen, God wants everyone to be saved. Maybe I need to say that again. God wants everyone to be obedient to the faith. God wants everybody to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. In fact, again, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He wants everybody to know. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Listen, we, Paul wants everybody, God, Jesus wants everybody, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's for everyone that whosoever believeth. 
Listen, I don't care whether you're Jew or Gentile. I don't care whether you're bond or free. I don't care whether you're male or female. Paul says, I don't care if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. I don't care if you're black or white. It it doesn't matter. Jesus is for everyone, all nations. He's not done. He finishes with three words, for his name. For his name. What's the whole purpose behind all of this? What's the whole purpose behind the gospel? Is it for us to get saved? That's a big part of it, but listen, it's not for us to get saved. It's for his name. For his name. Listen to this. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12. 1 John 2, 12, listen, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Salvation is definitely for us and to draw us into relationship with us, us in a relationship with God. 100% absolutely. But listen, it's for his name's sake. Why should we spread the gospel to the whole world? Not so everybody gets saved. Not so that we look amazing, but for his name's sake. Okay, what is his name? It's Jesus. Anybody happen to know what Jesus' name means? Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Good job, Robbie. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Look with with me in verse 21. And she, being Mary, found in verse 20, shall bring forth a son. Watch. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. And just like that, we've made a circle. We started with Jesus. We talked about how wonderful he was and how he's been prophesied through all through the Old Testament and how he's uh, given us this and how he, he is the Son of God and it's all about Jesus. And he's given us some things, grace, and we've received that grace and he's given us a calling and we should receive that calling for what purpose? So that all may know that everybody will come to the obedience of the faith. Why? For his name's sake, because it's about Jesus. Every single time. We're in Philippians, in our small groups. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. It is all to me. And to die is gain. Why? Because I have nothing to lose. I have nothing to be ashamed of. Jesus' name means Savior. and He saves people from their sins, so it's for his name's sake. Just like that, we're back where we started. He is our Savior. He is the way. He is the truth that makes men free. You know that the truth makes you free, right? And Jesus is that truth. He is the life and life more abundant. This is Jesus. Let me ask you, have you received him? Have you received him? Have you received his grace? And finally, let me ask, have you received his calling? Listen, you may not know what your calling is, but I can guarantee you this. His calling is that we get the gospel to all nations. Now that's going to look different for all of us, right? How, how that's accomplished. But that's his calling. Listen, just think about this. This is, this is part of the reason why we believe that Bible Baptist Church, our vision is to seek Christ and then to share hope. It's our whole goal. I just want to get closer to Christ so that I can share his hope. So that people will get closer to Christ and share his hope. And so that people will get closer to Christ and share his hope. And so that people will get closer to Christ and share his hope. And receive from him. 
God is calling you. God is giving you. Will you answer the call? Will you receive from him? Why? For his name's sake. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all you've done for us. Father, so often we get short-sighted. We forget about why we're doing what we're doing. Father, in reality, is to glorify your name. That is the reason you have left us here on this earth. It's the reason we are and were created for your glory. So, Father, I pray that tonight every single one of us would recognize that we need to receive grace and that we need to receive your calling so that people will know, that all the world may know who you are and what you've done for them. Father, thank you for the challenge tonight. I pray that we would go forth and that we would tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that your will would be accomplished in our lives. We love you so much. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.